I would like to acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples who are the traditional owners of the land that we meet on today, their elders past and present. In, welcoming, um, in 2007, a technology developer named Chris Messina sent a tweet suggesting that hashtags precede important words in tweets so that they could be grouped around common themes. Twitter was only a year old and its administrators reportedly told Ms. Mr Messina that the hashtag was for nerds and would not be used widely. In 2018, hashtags were being used to label user-generated content on more than 85% of the internet's busiest 50 websites by traffic, including the 261 million users of Twitter. That is quite a lot of nerds. Our lecturer today has performed quantitative analysis on over 35 million tweets, particularly those grouped around the hashtags Remain, Leave and Brexit and he's found some quite remarkable links with traditional forms of polling. Professor Kenneth Benoit is a professor of uh, computational social science in the Department of Methodology at the London School of Economics and Political Science. He's fluent in Hungarian, French, and the programming language called R, and will help us to make sense of the Brexit debate and the emerging field um, of data science. Could you welcome me and um, join me in welcoming Professor Benoit? Thank you very much for that introduction. And thank you all for coming uh, on this Friday for lunch to hear me talk about Brexit and data science. So just to give you a, a little bit of background beyond um, what Jackie already said. So this is based on work that is joint with um, Akitaka Matsuo, who worked with me on this project. It was a three-year project. It was funded by a European Research Council grant, one of these Horizon 2020 schemes. That's the European equivalent of your wonderful Australian Research Council scheme. Our project was called EU Engage. Um, and it was about, it was a multi-country, multi-site grant where we were interested in studying the engagement of citizens and elites in this multinational political space known as the European Union. The other project that you see here is a logo that we created for a previous European Research Council grant that I held for five years. And we created something called Quantita, which is a comprehensive software framework that I use for all of the analysis in this paper. Um, it stands for the Quantitative Analysis of Textual Data. I'm actually working on a book by that title uh, right now during my time uh, visiting at Australian <coughs> National University. So I'm uh, actually. Um, Normally, um, I'm at the London School of Economics. I'm in a fairly unusual department. It's called the Department of Methodology. We do a combination of data science, statistical methods for social science, and qualitative methods for social science. I'm also affiliated with the School of Politics and International Relations. That's the SPIR um, with the Australian National University. You probably know that acronym. And I'm going to be talking about the way that we studied for the EU Engage project, the attitudes that were manifest in the public debate through a very particular medium, and that is Twitter. If you don't use Twitter, so a lot of people don't use Twitter. I think something like in, in maybe in Australia, 60% of people have Twitter accounts, and not all of those people are active. But even if you don't use Twitter, you've probably heard of Twitter, or you've probably read things about Twitter, mainly because of President Trump in the United States can't seem to keep his thumbs off of Twitter um, every single day, and his tweets have now made news, and, and what politicians and political figures tweet about current events now regularly becomes news. Um, and that's because it offers them a way to go straight to the public, unfiltered, sometimes sitting around in their pajamas before breakfast when their advisors are out sweating somewhere, wondering, uh, you know, what is this person going to do today that we haven't been able to filter? Um, and it's really changed the way that political communication occurs. Well, we're not studying that phenomenon in particular. We're, we're looking at the tweets that the public uh, tweeted about Brexit as this referendum unfolded. So let me step back a little bit. I'm going to give you details about that shortly. But let me give you a little bit of the context about this. Um, this has, an act, has to do with an activity known as text mining. Text mining is pretty much 
It's metaphorically uh, what it sounds like. It's a mining activity where you're digging into a trove of resources, trying to filter out the valuable stuff from the dirt and the rocks. And in text, which is a large amount of unstructured information that we can read as qualitative human beings who think in terms of language and read in terms of language, we have to go in to a large amount of this sort of data and find systematic patterns and structure them. It's very easy to do uh, if you're looking at a small amount of text because we do this every single day. Um, we do this when we're reading anything. You do this if you're actually reading the slide right now. But if I were to give you 10 million of these slides, you would need some sort of tool to do that. The way that we're going to treat this text is something that is an approach in social science known as treating the text as data. What does this mean? Well, if you were a, a certain, let's say the other extreme would be if you were a certain student of literary theory in the mid-20s, you would treat the text as the end-all, be-all, and you would say that the intentions of the author or the circumstances of the, of, the, of the author were irrelevant. You're just focusing on the text itself. The text is the object of interest. In text as data approaches, we're saying we're not interested in the text in and of itself. We're interested in the text as an instrument to give us insights about the attitudes that created the text. We're interested in the text because it tells us something about, for example, the prevailing mood on an upcoming referendum, such as whether to vote to leave the European Union or stay in the European Union. We would treat the text as a poll, as a pollster would, would treat interviews with subjects in a poll. You're not so much interested in any particular interviewer, you're interested in the data that that interview, as part of a poll of several thousand interviewees, would tell you about the things that you're trying to uncover. The key is that we do some form of comparison. This is what social science involves. It's always compared to what? It's always a comparison. It's a comparison of measurements at specific time against previous measurements or a measurement of one subgroup against a control group or two different groups to figure out comparative differences in a systematic fashion. And the way that we do this to, is to use statistical models because these statistical models have rules that are, are well established through mathematical principles that allow us to make probabilistic statements when we compare the measurements of one group versus another group. And this goes back many, many decades in the field of statistics. And this notion of using text mining and data science combines linguistics, it combines computation, and it combines statistics to put this together into a structured way that we can apply basically the social scientific tools that involve statistics to a very qualitative form of data, which is text. So in this project, we use these techniques to analyze something that uh, at this stage, we thought it would be fairly historical. It's, it's, it is historical, I guess, but it's also very contemporary because no one quite knows exactly what's going to happen still, even though the referendum was two and a half years ago. Um, Brexit is something that there's a referendum in June 2016. And what we decided to do with our EU-funded project, interestingly, we were a little bit ahead of our time because we put in this massive grant application to study the public perception of the European project. And there were just the rumblings of Brexit. I remember the principal investigator on the project was saying, well, uh, yeah, this Brexit thing is going to blow over, right? Asking the UK team, right? You know, no, this is, no, this is not going to be serious. It's going to be like the Scottish referendum. They'll vote no, and then people will move on. Uh, maybe that's what people thought. I wasn't so sure, and we decided that we were going to take our project and reorient it to really just study Brexit because there were two things going on in the European Union at the time. One of them was Brexit and its possibility, and the other one was Greek exit from the Euro, um, which was very much a real possibility around 2015, but that storm seems to have blown over, or at least no one's paying attention to that much anymore because of Brexit. So we started a collection engine using a firm that we subcontracted to that had access to the full uh, data set of Twitter, we started our engine collecting tweets based on a set of search terms in January of 2016, and we collected that all the way through July of 2016. So anything that was happening on Twitter that mentioned anything related to Brexit, we captured it. We captured this based on the sort of hashtags that we were discussing earlier, these things that are prepended with this pound sign or um, this hash mark usernames, which on Twitter and most other social media are prefixed by the 
the at sign, this A with a little circle around it, and search terms, general search terms just like the word Brexit. These were the search terms that we used. So with this small collection of search terms, we started our net, basically, and what we captured in the net was 26, 26 or so million tweets over this six-month period. That's a lot of tweets. And one of the things to know about tweets, tweets at the time, I think, were only, um, what was it, 160 characters, and they, they, didn't, they then doubled after that. Um, they doubled like about two years ago or a year and a half ago. Um, we were capturing this, and that's not that much text, but there's, uh, for every tweet, the tweet represents about 15% of the actual data for a single tweet. All the rest of it is this massive amount of what we call metadata, which include identifying information about the person who sent the tweet, the time of the tweet, possibly the geolocation of the tweet, and a whole host of other information that comes uh, wrapped in the, the container that, um, that holds the tweet. So we were capturing terms like, obviously, Brexit um, was the main one, EU ref, and then there were various partisan ones like no to EU or yes to EU. Um, and some of these usernames were very, very clearly set up for, um, for things related to Brexit. And this was not a huge list, but we didn't really need a huge list because pretty much if you were going to talk about Brexit in a, in a tweet, you mentioned Brexit. So that was our number one search term that retrieved what we were looking for. In the data set that we ended up using for the analysis, we had 3.6 million users. So there were 3.6 million different user accounts that sent tweets. The average number of tweets that a person sent or a user sent, we'll get to that issue in a moment, was about 7.2. The median tweet was only one. What does that mean? That means that at least 50% of the users of our seven of our 3.6 million sent only a single tweet that mentioned Brexit. So it's not a very, very common thing to do. Um, the average is skewed because there were a number of very high volume users that pulls the average up relative to the, the central tendency as measured through the median. The maximum number of tweets that was sent by a user account was 81,000. So either we have a very disturbed, uh, hyperactive individual <laughs> which is possible, nothing's impossible on the internet, but, uh, or we have a bot, we have what's known as a bot, and there were bots. There were, these are automatic accounts that use the same sort of filtering that we were seeing, and they automatically rebroadcast a tweet, and that's what the 81,000 was. And there were a few of those that we ended up excluding from the analysis, because they were literally just repeating tweets. Okay, so we've got this massive data set. One of the things that we don't have compared to survey data, if we were taking a survey, we could ask an individual, what is your opinion on Brexit? Are you in favor of or are you against? Maybe some various degree of opposition or support. We could also ask them information uh, about their demographics. We could ask them information about their other political uh, leanings. We could correlate those because we have, in one row of our spreadsheet, when we get the data back from the pollster, information about the same individual on these various dimensions. With social media, we don't have that. We have some information from the public profile of the user, but it doesn't mention, we don't actually have a measure of their gender. We don't have a measure necessarily of where they live. We don't have a measure of their age. We certainly don't have a measure of whether they voted conservative or labor or liberal Democrats or Greens or anything like that. So one of the things that we have to do with social media is find a way to add this information in. Because what we're really interested in, in doing for this study is to figure out the differences in language between people who supported Brexit and people who were opposed to Brexit. So how do we do that? Well, we augment the data that we collected using a technique known as machine learning. That sounds very fancy. You know, you think of self-driving cars or robots. They're based on versions of machine learning. Um, what we used was a very simple sort of one-shot machine learning where we were able to train a, what is known in machine learning as a classifier using information that we had a high degree of confidence in. In other words, we had information that were very obvious pro-Brexit accounts, and we had information in the form of very obvious pro-Remain accounts. And 
We did this by selecting what we call power users. Power users were people with at least 100 tweets in the corpus. There were about 15,000 of these. We filtered those even further to find accounts that were very, very clearly extremely partisan in terms of, you know, we want to stay in, we want to leave. That, that was the whole purpose of setting up those accounts. And we used that for what's called a training set. So we trained our machine classifier using the patterns that were evident using from the text of accounts that were very clearly pro-leave and very clearly pro-remain. And that allowed us to take this extreme set of a very small set and train a classifier. And this training of the classifier, I think, involved something uh, 200 accounts. So we were, to take, we were able to leverage the information by manually annotating 200 user accounts and using that to predict the pro or leave orientation of 6.2 million. And that's the power of machine learning. We're able to augment that data by leveraging a small amount of information that we know and predicting that on a large amount of information that we, we don't know. And this is just a bit of diagnostic where we showed um, some of the differences in predictive accuracy. And the predictive accuracy here uses two types of classifiers if for the technically minded, and I'd be happy to talk about this later. We use what's called a naive Bayes classifier. We used a multinomial naive Bayes classifier, which looks at differences in, in the relative word frequencies. Um, that are found in the text and, and predicts probabilities for those and aggregates those probabilities into a joint probability which can be used to tell basically the probability that a user is pro-remain or pro-leave. And you can see that the blue bars approach about 90% accuracy. So for the, um, the optimal classifiers that we chose, we were able to predict accurately about 90% of the accounts that we applied our, our tool to. Which is, which is really good. Um, if you were to have human beings like a team of PhD students working all summer to do this, they, you'd be lucky if they were also 90% accurate. When we looked at the predictive set of predicting the um, various uh, tweets that we had in our data set, we also see that this roughly mirrors, it's a fairly balanced uh, predictive set, it roughly mirrors what we uh, thought that we observed in the electorate and in the pattern of tweets as a whole. It was about uh, roughly one-third, one-third, one-third. In social science terms, we'll call that one-third, 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 that we have this remain, we have this leave, and we have this neutral category. And what does, you know, just to explain how we, how we predicted that, so we, we came up with an actual probability that a user was remain. If that probability was less than 0.2, which means 20% or less, or greater than 0.8, which means 80% or more, we called it respectively leave or remain. And if they were in this middle 60%, which is when you take the bottom and the top 20% away, in this middle 60% zone, we called it, we just basically said it's not clear enough, we'll call them neutral. Because what they were saying was not either pro-remain pro or pro-leave enough for us to make a confident prediction. This allowed us to take the information that does come with the tweet, part of the metadata I was talking about earlier, which is the form of a very precise timestamp. So we know down to the second when the tweet was created and published, and we can use that information along with our classification to plot the degree of remain and leave tweets. Now, the leave tweets are the blue, the remain tweets are the red, and this is a trend over time which shows the smooth tendency, which is sort of the, the typical tendency, absent sort of daily fluctuations which are caused by these jagged lines. Depressingly, there were only two points in time when the pro-remain tweets outnumbered the pro-leave tweets. And that was this spike here that occurred towards the end of February, and this is something we'll talk about a little bit later, which was actually a debate um, that occurred. It was sort of a, a, a public event where there was a big uh, public debate about, about this, and a lot of people were tweeting during the public debate, and you can see that the Remain uh, tweets outnumbered the Leave briefly, and then it went back into this almost equilibrium state where the pro-Leave was outnumbering the Remain. And you can also see that there was a massive spike, which was actually during the, 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 day, the, the two-day period surrounding the referendum itself. And 
If you were paying attention to this slide, you'll see that the remain uh, actually outnumbers the leave tweets. So you might be wondering, how is this possible that it looks like remain is being outnumbered by leave pretty consistently across the period? Well, one of the things if you study the y-axis, you'll note that we've got these numbers that are to the powers of 10, their scientific notation. So each of these ticks along the y-axis is actually 10 times greater than the previous tick. The only way for us to plot this volume was to use a logarithmic scale. It's like the Richter scale with an earthquake. Every time there's an earthquake, some announcer comes out and tells you that the seven is actually 10 times more powerful than the six. That's because it's an exponential scale um, to base 10. So logarithms convert that into the exponent. In other words, four uh, is 10 times less than five, which is 10 times less than six, which is why the fact that we have the leave spiking during these periods contributes a massive amount of volume that if we didn't plot this logarithmically, it wouldn't fit on the screen. So if we try to verify whether our classifier looks correct, we can actually take the tweets from all of the members of parliament in the United Kingdom up to this point, and we can see whether we have some face validity from our classifier by comparing what we sort of knew at the time, at least, about political parties and comparing this to the breakdown of pro-remain versus pro-leave. So these are the parties, and, and by the way, in the United Kingdom, even in 2016, I think some 80% of members of parliament had Twitter accounts. Whether they use them themselves or not is another question, but they had Twitter accounts. And a lot of them were tweeting actively about Brexit. Well, this shows us what we suspected about labor. Labor was a little bit late to announce its intentions um, pretty consistently throughout the Brexit um, episode. Labor was predominantly pro-Remain, which is represented by the red here, and the Leave group by the blue, which I think may reverse the colors from the previous slide. You'll have to forgive me for that. The Conservative was predominantly pro-Remain, but there was a sizable pro-Leave uh, faction, and there was a larger neutral faction. And if we interpret that, you know, this must have shifted uh, and it did seem to shift. And we could also see, like, what would be the litmus test? If we really got this wrong, we would look at the UK Independence Party. Well, they only had one member of parliament. They were pro-leave. If for some reason they were pro-remain, we would have to question what we were doing. You also see the Scottish National Party should be very strongly pro-remain, and they are. All of the Northern Irish parties were also pro-remain, with the exception of the Democratic Unionist Party, uh, which unfortunately is the junior is a junior member of the coalition under under a special agreement. Um, but the short story from this analysis is that these results have a high degree of face validity. They seem to make sense in terms of what we knew. Um, nothing alarming here. We can also z narrow in on a few users, and uh, I did this to sort of. Um, I did this because there were a lot of accounts at the London School of Economics that were tweeting about Brexit, and they were almost all, all of my colleagues uh, were pretty much pro-remain. Um, pro so on the y-axis here, we plotted on a logarithmic scale, once again, the number of tweets. And on the x-axis, this horizontal axis, this is a probability that the user was pro-remain. So if you're a zero probability of pro being pro-remain, it means you're remain, it means you're strongly leave. And if you're a, a 1.0 on pro-remain, it means you're almost certainly uh, a remainer. And some of my colleagues here, which you may, may not know them, but two very well-known scholars in EU politics at the London School of Economics are Simon Hicks and Sarah Hobolt. And um, you can see that they're very strongly pro-remain. Their probability of being pro-remain was about 0.9. You can see that I'm up there, too. I actually sent some tweets from my account about Brexit. There's Ken Benoit sort of in the middle of the right. There are some in the middle uh, that we called neutral, but by and large, all the LSE accounts were strongly pro-remain. Then there's this strange individual over here, LSE Eckford. We weren't really sure who that was. Um, well, one of the nice things about Twitter is when you tweet, you agree to make your tweets public, and you still have technically copyright over them, but you're not allowed to hide them because that's part of the agreement you sign when you sign up for Twitter. So it's perfectly okay for us to investigate who this person is. And it turns out that this was some uh, 
radical pro-Trump uh, person that had nothing to do with the London School of Economics, just had, had a, it was a false match, in other words, that this person's account started with LSE because her name is Linda Siegford, and she was basically um, tweeting pro-Trump things and uh, something, had something to do, for example, about Brexit. Um, I doubt she knew much about Brexit, but anyway. This is a plot known as a word cloud. So if you see any text mining results, you'll almost certainly see this sort of plot. What is this plot? Well, we, in this plot, we take just the hashtags out of the text. We put them into this cloud where the size of the hashtag as it's plotted is proportional to the frequency with which it occurred in the text. So the bigger the hashtag, the more common it, it was relative to the other hashtags. So this is a really quick visual way of seeing what were the most common hashtags. And we've done one better here. We've partitioned this into the three sides based on our predictive uh, model, whether it was remain, leave, or neutral. You can see that the most common uh, leave hashtag was hashtag leave EU. The most common uh, remain hashtags were things um, actually, the mo labor in for Britain, but also Forex, and there were some neutral ones that had to do with uh, EU referendum was a fairly neutral way to refer to the referendum itself. But the interesting thing, and we'll come back to this shortly, is that a lot of the most common terms in the Remain camp were about economics. They were about foreign exchange. They were about money and the financial sector. And this is something that we'll come back to because a lot of the debate about people who are concerned with the effects of leaving were basically on the economy and on the financial sector. And we'll also see that the language of the support for leaving had more to do with identity and sovereignty and this notion of empowerment and taking back control. This was a network. This is a results which I won't dwell on, but in essence, one of the things we can do, in addition to looking at the text of the tweets itself, is we can use data from social media that is publicly available where we can find out the accounts that the people who tweeted follow. We can construct, a, in effect, a matrix for each user of which users they also follow. And it turns out, without looking at the text of users at all, we can use multidimensional scaling methods to scale this network of followerships to basically put people in a single dimension that will tell us something about their political orientation. This is developed by my colleague Pablo Barbera, who, just to give you an idea of the sort of department I work in, he was taken away from us by a competitive job offer from outside. He's basically leaving in two months' time not by another university. He wasn't poached by, I don't know, Harvard or Oxford from us. He was taken by Facebook. So he's gone to work for Facebook. This is the sort of thing that they do at Facebook. They use your information that consists of who you follow and who you like and what you post, and they, they can develop a model that'll basically, they'll know what sort of toothpaste you use and how you vote um, and, and all sorts of things about you in a really scary fashion. This is a very simple way of doing that based on what's publicly available on Twitter. And if you were to drill down and examine some of these things which you can't possibly see on the slide, you could see that this uh, is a way of mirroring the orientations about the accounts that we predicted using the text mining methods using the machine learning. And if you plot this in terms of a, what this is called a density plot, which is sort of a smooth version of the frequencies, where the remain score would be this axis of basically uh, pro-remain versus pro-leave, you see this bimodal distribution, which is exactly what we observed in the rest of the data. There is a peak for leave and there's a peak for remain, and unfortunately, there's a valley in the middle. This is an example of what we call a polarized electorate. And one of the features about this debate, like so much else in politics today and other contexts, is that there's a polarization. This is bad because it would be much better if there were a moderate middle talking some sense into the debate rather than two sides talking past one another, which is very much what we saw in the Brexit campaign. Okay, so I'm going to show you two more things and then I'll take some questions. So one of these things involves looking at the text for a type of analysis known as sentiment analysis. And I'm going to explain what this is and how we did it. 
The second thing I'm going to show you is some network analysis where we used a, an unsupervised machine learning model, another one, to basically figure out which topics we could extract from these millions of tweets using automatic methods, and then we, we characterize that by the side. So you may or may not have heard of sentiment analysis. It's commonly used, say, in um, studying. It's a, it's a marketing tool, perhaps. Uh, so let's say that you got a lot of product reviews from your website, from your Airbnb, or you're selling things on Amazon, and you've got product reviews where people describe things. You can perform a type of analysis on those texts known as sentiment analysis. And it tells you, using words that are pre-associated with being positive or negative, whether the tone of that review is positive or negative. You use this doing, using a technique known as dictionary analysis. It's a dictionary because it's a collection of words that some person has basically said, these are words that are positive in this context. These are words that are negative. And we're going to map the text that we found using automatic methods, of course, to count the number of positive and negative words from the text and construct an index from that. This is a very common method going back decades in psychology. Psychologists develop methods of people's inner psychological states because they don't have access, of course, you know, to mind reading machines, which is what psychologists would like. So they ask people to say things and then they interpret in a systematic way what, what, what evidence about their inner states exists from what they've said. And they've constructed dictionaries for these things that are based on uh, lots of testing, lots of publication, lots of studies. So we have used some of these dictionaries because they contain categories for things like negative and positive emotion. That's the basic idea of sentiment analysis. But they also contain words that are indicators of language about politics, language about power, languages, language about quantitative um, analysis, quantitative arguments, language that is considered tentative versus language that would be, by contrast, confident or certain. Also language that is a trigger, trigger for sadness, and language that is future-oriented versus past-oriented. So we're going to use all these dictionaries to compare the text that we predicted as being pro-remain with the text that we predicted as being pro-leave. Just to give you an idea, so this is language from the category of reward, and these are the sorts of trigger words that were uh, in the dictionary for reward. These little stars mean uh, it's a general pattern match um, shortcut. It means that anything can exist there. So when uh, we look at the word accumule, which is the third one on the top row, that means accumulate, accumulation, accumulated. It'll match all those. And this comes from the software that I developed, this Quantita software that I mentioned on the first slide. Um, and we're able to apply this very quickly, even to, um, even to tens of millions of tweets and get results because the software is really efficient. So let's look at reward language. What does this show? Well, these are very small proportions because the overall text is massive and the number of actual words that are found is small. That's not the point, uh, what those numbers are. The point is how we compare the different categories because this is all about comparison. If we compare the leave to the remain, we can see that there is more language in the discussion about the leave option than in the discussion about the remain option that referred to things about reward. People who were talking about leaving were promising or expecting reward for the act of leaving, taking back control, getting back money that would otherwise be sent to the European Union, having more control over immigration and leading to a better and fairer and perfect society and all the other things that were promised. Um, the remainers, as we'll see, were more interested in, uh, it's been pejoratively called Project Fear, but it's not entirely pejorative because, in truth, they were more warning of the consequences, as you would rightly would, about upending decades of the status quo arrangement, which had governed pretty much all of the economy um, up to that stage. And you would think that there would be concerns about what might happen in that uncertain situation. Well, those translated into not reward, but more concerns about uncertainty and fear. If we look at positive versus negative emotion, my wife's always telling me that this slide is hard to understand. Um, it's called positive versus negative because we measured the positive words and we measured the negative words and we took a difference between them. 
So what we're comparing here is that leave had more positive words compared to the negative words than remain had positive words compared to negative words. It means the, in politics, pretty much language will always be more positive than negative because those people would never really have made it into politics if they just went around being mostly negative. Um, people in politics are mostly positive. They can be negative when they talk about something very specific, but on balance, you will see more positive language than negative. The key is not whether just comparing positive wouldn't give us this picture. The key is whether the positives outweigh the negatives and to what extent. Well, the positives outweighed the negatives more for the leave than for remain or neutral, and that's the point here. It, it means on balance that the positivity, who, who was winning the net positivity contest? Well, it was the leave side. Sadness, the remain team was basically talking about much more sad languages and themes. I shouldn't say team. This is, this is the dialogue on social media. So we should, we should keep that clear. This is not part of a campaign. I mean, some of these accounts were, were explicit campaigns. But this is all mentions of uh, Brexit classified by the account, um, whether it was remain or leave. The accounts that were pro-remain were using more sad language than the accounts that were Pro leaf. And the neutral in this case is winning where they're the most sad, probably because of listening to the debate on the other sides um, would make anyone sad. Here's another thing about politics future versus past language. And you could almost say this is just a feature of language itself. In general, people in language, you will see more discussion of past present and past versus future. It's just a, a feature of language. This would be true for almost any language you would apply it to. So this negative here comes because we're using logarithms once again. It's not that important. But zero is the neutral point. And it means that leave was more future relation, in relation to the past than remain was future in relation to the past. So there was a little bit more backwards looking among the remain side by a factor of about two in this case versus the leave side. Um, looking, which was more looking forward relative to looking backward. Tentative language. Tentative language means that you're saying things with a little bit of qualification rather than being very certain about it. And we see that the leave um, was using a lot less tentative language than the remain side. Power language. This is very much related to things about taking control, which is one of the trigger words for power language. There was a lot more discussion about this in the leave side. The remain side was, the discussion was much more about losing control than about taking control. And you can imagine which, which message is more persuasive in politics. Um, people tend to like being told that they're going to be able to take control versus lose control, even when that's not true. Quantitative language. I mentioned that there was a lot of discussion about economics and foreign exchange and trade figures and how much the economy would shrink. There was an episode on a famous television debate where one of the government ministers came out and said, we're sick of these arguments and you're economists. We can get experts to say anything and we, we don't care about your economists. You actually had a government minister for exiting the European Union, dismissing the results of some of the best economists that people could find. That's the uh, very typical of some of the prominent people advocating Brexit, that they tried to shift the argumentation and the dialogue away from neutral arguments that might be related to economic forecast, even the government's own forecast, because they dismissed those as being politically motivated. The Remain side had a lot more discussion about the quantitative aspects than the Leave side, and that shows up mildly here in the social media analysis, but not as strongly as we might have expected. So if we conclude from the sentiment analysis, the Leave side was more oriented towards reward, it was more positive, it was more assertive of power, it was less quantitative, it was less tentative, it used less sad language, and it was more oriented towards the future than towards the past. And we can plot this sort of thing over time. You see similar patterns of the positivity versus negativity, for example, on the leave side was very consistently across the spectrum uh, higher than it was for the neutral side. And we can do the same thing for the other dimensions, tentative language, et cetera. You can see some spikes here, but these trends that we see are the smooth trends because they're a more typical representation without these uh, small spikes. 
Right. I said there was one more type of analysis before we stop for questions, and that is related to topic models. Topic models kind of revolutionized the field of text mining in computer science when they were developed about 15 years ago. They offer a method of unsupervised machine learning using a fairly fancy and turns out not trivial to estimate statistical model that figures out the collections of words that occur together that we interpret as topics. We can run this on millions of text and it identifies the clusters of words into clusters that we would interpret as topics and we can estimate for each, each text what the proportion of topics that they covered was. So if we have a topic that has to do with foreign exchange, for each uh, text we can figure out the proportion of the words that were devoted to foreign exchange. It's a wonderful tool um, and when we combine it with information from our prediction about uh, leave or remain, we can use a, a modern variant of this uh, type of model to tell us something about the influence of being remain versus leave would have on the prevalence of your topics. This for, technical, for the technically inclined is known as a structural topic model that comes from a paper by some of my colleagues in political science actually, Robert Stewart and Tingley um, published in 2014. So here's the sort of thing that uh, the analysis allows you to do. And I realize that unless you've you know, studied machine learning and statistics and some of these things, you have no idea what I was just talking about. And that's perfectly fine. Um, you would be, uh, you know, be in company with 98% of all normal, healthy human beings. Um, but hopefully you can interpret this plot. Because what this plot is telling you is that, once again, um, on the x-axis, we have this effect of being remain versus being leave. And this is a little what's called a dot chart, which shows us the labels that we assigned to the topics when we got the results from the computer and we interpreted them. These are the labels that we assigned based on interpreting the words that we found in the topic. Um, and the more to the right that these are, the more these were associated with being a remain um, account versus being a leave account. Well. You can see, starting at the top, there was an actual topic in the Brexit debate about Donald Trump. Um, and why that would really have anything to do with Brexit, um, I think that there were some Leave people who were taking inspiration from the um, America First message. They were thinking that this would be the version of taking back sovereignty, anything that gives more sovereignty versus uh, answerability to an external power is something that would be positive for Trump. Well, that was the strongest topic among leavers, believe it or not. And then another one, the second strongest topic was um, basically concerns over the spread of Islam and Islamic uh, culture in Britain. Now, this was deeply unsettling for us because neither one of these two things really had anything to do with Brexit or leaving the European Union. And the, the Muslim communities that are a part of British life have nothing to do with uh, the sort of immigration controls that would um, be the sort of thing that Parliament could control after being able to exclude European uh, citizens of the European Union um, from settling freely in Britain, which is what they're allowed to do under the current arrangement. And if we go down through these topics, we'll see that um, it starts to become fairly economic as you move towards the pro-Remain topics. They were concerned about things like the economy. They're also concerned about some of the regional effects, like the Scottish, Scotland, and Northern Ireland topic. Um, and also, there were some other topics which we interpreted as things like anger against the Leave campaign. One of the biggest points of discussion among people on the Remain side was just anger at the misinterpretation, we could say, of some of the uh, facts that they perceived was happening among the Leave campaign. We can plot some of the hashtags that occurred and some of the most common words that occurred here. And you can see, interestingly, in the immigration topic, the most common hashtag was this MAGA. This is the hashtag that essentially is your tattoo saying you're a Trump supporter if you're using social media in the United States, you only use this hashtag if you're pro-Trump. So no one who's anti-Trump would use this. They, they just won't use it because it's, it's, it's a badge. It's like wearing the red hat. This is exactly the same thing as wearing the red Trump hat. Um, and interestingly, this was not the most common term in the Trump topic. It was the most common term in the immigration topic. Even though making America great again really had nothing to do with Brexit. 
The National Health Service was a big topic because one of the promises of the Leave campaign was that millions more would flow per week into the National Health Service because of the rebate that would be um, returned when uh, didn't have to pay that to the European Union. So this is a big topic that there was a whole set of discussion about this. And one of the nice things about this type of model is we're not only able to figure out which words are associated with this topic, we can figure out the prevalence of each user and how much they discussed, say, the national health topic versus the Scotland topic. Then there were things about Brexit and the market, Brexit and the economy, and these are just some diagnostic things that are available for looking at the content. And um, I'd be happy to make these materials available somewhere if people want to look at these a little bit more closely. And if we just summarize which topics uh, were strongly associated with each side, um, we can see that the topics that we fit, the remain topics were very much concerned versus the leave side with economic risk, with exchange rates, with financial risk, stock market risk. There were some topics that occurred such as Obama in London where Obama actually paid a visit and he urged people not to leave. Um, and that wasn't a very positive, so that actually didn't help much because um, you can imagine not everyone likes North Americans coming and telling them how they should run their political affairs. Um, there is a, a leave topic called Brexit the movie. There is a movie you can find on YouTube. It's called Brexit the movie. Um, it's painful to watch, but it is there. <laughs> and people were talking about it. And David Cameron, that person who people have kind of forgotten about it because he completely disappeared from the face of the planet. Um, after losing the referendum. We think that it, we call it losing, um, but he was very much in the uh, public discourse then anyway. And the last thing that we can do with these topics is we can construct what's called a network of topics, which is the degree of interconnectivity that users had when they mentioned various topics and how connected the topics were. Um, and I realize this is probably too small, well actually maybe not, but. You can see that these topics that I showed you in this list here are, are colored as red or blue depending on whether they leave or remain. And you can see that there's a tight cluster among the blue ones about the cluster of topics that people on the remain side were mentioning the same sorts of arguments. The leave topics were a little bit more spread out, but the biggest thing from this plot is that the leave arguments and the remain arguments, so we could say arguments, topics, were really pretty much disconnected. This is not a very connected network graph when it comes to things that link these, what we call nodes, the blue nodes and the red nodes are not really connected very much. So you were using a series of topics, if you were pro-leave, that were very different from the ones on pro-remain. It wasn't a debate over the amount of financial exposure that might happen as a result of Brexit. It was a debate over arguments for leaving that weren't related to finance and arguments for remaining that were related to finance, and they were totally disconnected. In other words, this is scientific evidence from big data that shows what a lot of people thought. These are two sides essentially having different conversations and talking past one another. So in summary, we use text analysis to gather this information. We use it to predict whether the account holder um, person creating the tweets was pro-remain or pro-leave. We were able to figure out the most common terms and hashtags by the side of being pro-remain or pro-leave. We we're able to use some of these networks of followerships to estimate ideology, even though I showed you that plot didn't really explain it. We use sentiment analysis via dictionaries to figure out these various psychological categories and compare those by side. We're able to use topic models to figure out the topics that were being discussed by side and some of their connections, um, map those connections using network analysis. How did we do all this? Well, I have a very smart colleague working with me, Aki, um, but we did this from this first project I have, which is a, an open source project called Quantita, which I'm working on a book on in my time here at the ANU. Um, this is a project that's been running since 2012. You can see this uh, activity plot here is the number of code updates that we've made to the software over time. And you can see that there's a lot of activity on there and it's very, very current activity. We work on this pretty much 
every week, um, sometimes every day. And this was taken this morning. Um, this software is getting downloaded about 15,000 times a month. Um, it's been downloaded almost a quarter of a million times so far and has a pretty wide user base. Um, and it provides the tools in a very open source way, which means it's freely available and you can see the source code in case you don't trust what we've done, you can actually see exactly how it was done and offer corrections if you think there's something wrong. Um, and that's what these little badges show. So this is very much a form of what we call open science. We're not asking you to trust us. You can, you're free to criticize, verify, and, and replicate what we've done if you wish, because that's what we think science should be like. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you very much, Kenneth. I think it's such a dense topic, but you've made it really accessible for us. So I suspect there are quite a few questions lurking in the audience. We'll bring the mics to you. So there's a gentleman in the middle here, Philia, who's in the brown jacket. Uh, thank you. Thank, thanks very much, Ken. Uh, my name is Mick Chisnell. I'm from the IGPA at the University of Canberra. Um, a fascinating topic. Um, one of the, the question I had was the, one of the readings of what happened with Brexit was it was an intergenerational problem. Or not problem, but it's an intergenerational. The older people tended to vote uh, leave and younger people tended to vote remain. Um, how does that correlate with the use of Twitter? And did you compensate for the fact that just possibly, and is it true, that older people tweet less than younger people? Uh, it's not just possibly true, it's, def it's definitely true. Um, it's an interesting question because you're absolutely right that uh, surveys show that there was a, a difference in, in uh, there's a correlation with age. Um, younger people tended to be more pro-Remain. Younger people also tended not to have actually voted in the referendum uh, in much greater numbers than older people who, who abstained. Um, so one of the problems with social media, like Twitter, is we don't know the age of the user. We don't even know their gender. You can, there are tools, there are clever tools to try to infer that, but age is a much harder one. So we tried some analysis on that. We tried some analysis on gender as well and region, but um, the results were, it was, it was too difficult to get data with confidence on that. So what, what we, we've done in a separate project is we have a 6,000 respondent survey that was taken at the time of the referendum by YouGov. And it has all that information about demographics, age, location, profession, educational level. And we, we were trying to see whether the, the patterns that we observed in that survey, including people's reasons for supporting or um, opposing Brexit were similar in the language that they used in that survey to what we observed on Twitter. Because we thought, okay, we're making the argument that in some way there's a representative discourse about Brexit through social media, representative not just from, you know, 20 somethings who are tweeting all the time and the rest of the electorate is, you know, absent from this discussion. And it turns out there was a very, very close correspondence between what we observed and what was taken in this much more representative s survey. In other words, we were pretty confident that what we observed on social media in our exercises is, is a microcosm of the broader debate. There's a question up here. Thanks. Um, I'm interested to know, maybe I missed something, but did your analysis prior to the vote retrospectively predict a Brexit positive vote? So one of the things that we, we thought about briefly and then realized we wouldn't even try it was predicting the vote. Um, so we have a saying in social science, a prediction is a very dangerous activity, especially when it's about the future. <laughs> uh, the problem is precisely this issue of being representative. So, um, you know, if, if if we, if you, if to show up to vote, they required you to show proof of your Twitter account, 
then we could have predicted the election from Twitter, but that's obviously not how it works. So we were more interested in characterizing the discourse as observed in social media and the patterns of that as partitioned by being pro-leave or pro-remain than we were about predicting. So we, the project was never about predicting. And sort of a follow-up question. Um, one of the things that's unusual about Australia is that we have compulsory voting. And so um, you tend to fight for the undecided or middle ground when campaigning, whereas in other countries you tend to try and motivate your core voters to come out and it's a bit more polarising. So did you, was there any um, topic model analysis to bring in compulsory voting after the Brexit vote? Um, no, actually. Um, and I think uh, it's a combination of a, a view of the right of the individual to abstain and then political motivations where, for example, uh, you, you may know this is a very politicized issue in the United States, um, voter suppression is something the Republicans are often accused of active voter suppression because if you extend the electorate, you're picking up groups that tend to vote Democratic. And um, it's something that if you're Republican, you don't want, the, the last thing you'd want is compulsory voting. There's a little bit of that in the UK, but there's a lot more of, of a tradition which basically says it's everyone's right not to vote mm. if they so choose. Mm. But in, in the UK, if voting would be compulsory, the argument would be that Brexit wouldn't have gotten an affirmative vote, right? That's probably right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but in you know, turnout in referendums is is, is usually very low. Um, Thank you. I think we've got time for. We might get two in, so we'll take Sorry, the gentleman no, first no, up. No, no, I was going to bring the microphone. Oh, okay. Thanks. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, thanks for a, a very accessible talk. Um, and very interesting. Uh, you mentioned briefly about bots and you talked about removing them from some of the data. Um, and I noticed in the uh, chart that you had of the uh, social network of the users, one of the ones that was very popular but very on the pro-remain, sorry, pro-exit, pro-leave side, had a very bot-like username. Um, I was wondering, did you do any analysis of the bots and, and particularly from the perspective of, of whether they are sort of prim primarily um, you know, leave or remain? Um, about nine months into our project when we had already gotten these results and we were disseminating them, I, there was a team at some other universities who did, basically they were able to sift through similar data and figure out which ones were Russian factory accounts but basically from being manipulated. Um, and we kicked ourselves, thought, why didn't we, you know, why didn't we jump on that? Because there was evidence of that from the beginning. Um, and those were the sort of bots that were designed to not look like bots. They were like groups of, of accounts that were working in concert. The ones that we detected and removed were just the very simplest type, which is an aggregator bot. It, it finds anything that's from the uh, collection of pro remain accounts and just retweets them. But the, the other ones were sort of working in concert in clever ways, and they were, they were very cl clearly based in some Russian-supported uh, state uh, group that was trying to influence the, uh, the campaign. Mm. I've got a final question down here. Yeah. I was curious to see uh, the word queen appear on a number of the screens. What was the role of the royal family in the debate? Uh, pretty much absent. So they, they, the royal family pretty much stays out of, uh, out of these sorts of debates. But, but why, why did that word appear then on the screens? Probably uh, it was connected with sovereignty and the notion of um, the, it, this is a technique, it's, it basically makes a, a mess of language by just chopping up the words it's called a bag of words approach. It, it disassociates words from their context. And it's quite possible that this was something to do with um, the Queen's English or some, some, some tradition that included something about the Queen. Uh, it's hard to say. So I could go back to the data and I could figure that out um, using keyword search and looking at the context. But I suspect it's something that is related to discussions of, of, of sovereignty. Look, thank you very much. I think um, you can hear from the questions that it's been a very thought-provoking talk and it's taken us into an area that um, I certainly was very unfamiliar with and um, 
really given us a lot to take away from today. So join me in thanking Professor Bernard. Thank <laughs> you.